Hi, this is Denny Somak. I'm a producer, best-selling author, and a rock historian. And this is The Rock Podcast. Now, in this episode, we're taking a look at one of the most significant bands in the history of rock and roll, and one of my all-time favorites, The Yardbirds. So I'll give you some history, and then go to my archives, and you'll hear The Yardbirds' story as told by the various members of the band. And I want to dedicate this program to Jeff Beck, who passed away on January 10th, 2023, while we were recording this. As you probably know, the Yardbirds morphed into Led Zeppelin, who were originally called the New Yardbirds. And they are the most important and influential British band after the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, But the main reason is because the Yardbirds had three of the greatest guitarists ever go through their ranks. Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, and Jimmy Page. The original band also included drummer Jim McCarty, bass player Paul Samuel Smith, vocalist Keith Relf, and rhythm guitarist Chris Drea. I'll let him sum up the various phases of the band. Eric was a blues purist. That's where he learned a lot of that, you know, his, his influence. Jeff was just a, a, an unrecognized genius who spoke through his guitar but was able to fulfill our wireless dreams with our writing and getting those great sounds out, you yeah. know. And then Jimmy was a true professional, you know, who wanted to carry on with the contracts and uh, even, even those grueling sort of Dick Clark type tours, you know. He got us through it, bless him. So let's start with how Eric Clapton first joined the group. He met the other members while at art school in London. First, here's Jim McCarty. Well, uh, Eric came in. Uh, we originally had Top Top on. He, well, he was studying at, at art school, and uh, his parents very, were very keen that he should carry on studying, and they, they didn't like the idea of us sort of playing, you know, all these all-nighters and that sort of the thing that we were doing then was just playing around sort of London clubs you know, every night of the week, and uh, they were quite strict on him, and he was quite a quite a young guy, I think he was about 17, and uh, so they, they sort of stopped him doing it. And Keith and Chris, coming from Kingston Art School, they were at art school, Kingston, which is in South London, they, they knew of Eric Clapton, who had, had a bit of a reputation already, he was actually at the art school, but he had a, a reputation as a blues guitar player. So they um, they asked him to come and sort of audition with us. So uh, he came down, and we thought, oh, this guy, you know, knows what he's doing. So, so we went from there. Here is Eric Clapton's version of the story. The first guitar I ever had was um, a gut string, a Spanish guitar, and I couldn't really get the hang of it. I was only 13. I tried and tried and tried, and I gave up. And I took up guitar a bit later, once I'd heard Muddy Waters, because it sounded to me like it was easier. (laughs) Wrong. So then it wasn't acoustic I wanted anymore. I wanted an electric guitar. And actually, within a very short space of time, I had got somewhere with it. I bumped into people that had the same interests, that liked Muddy Waters, like Little Walter, like Big Bill Burnsy, like Robert Johnson. And that was uh, the original Yardbirds. The Yardbirds were known for their live performances, and in fact, their debut album was recorded live at the famous Marquee Club in London. It was called Five Live Yardbirds, and Eric Clapton is uh, playing guitar on this debut album, and he remained with the band until the release of their first hit record, For Your Love. More on that later. Right now, if you were at that show, this is what you heard. Good evening, and... Welcome, and now it is time for bird marizing, yard marizing, in fact, most blues wedding, yard birds. Here they are. Here they are, one by one. The drums, Jim McCarty. The rhythm guitar, Chris Dreyer. The bass, Paul Samuel Smith. Lead guitar, Eric Slohan Clapton. The singer and harp, Keith Rowe. Five live yardbirds. 
The Yardbirds were building a great following on the London club circuit, but they needed to expand their reputation and they needed a hit single in order to get on the radio. And For Your Love suddenly appears, and it's a hit for the Yardbirds. But Eric Clapton was pissed. Jim McCarty. Oh, we were doing blues. We started with, you know, we, we were doing Jimmy Reed and Howling Wolf, Slim Harpo, Chuck Berry, all that stuff. And we followed after the Stones in the Crawdaddy Club in Richmond when they left and uh, they went on the big UK tours. They started having hits. Um, and we found it was always very difficult to record our, our songs and get the same excitement that we got when we played live. You know, the English studios in those days were, were a bit, you know, not so advanced, really, and we always had trouble. So we, you know, we put out the live album, which seemed to capture the excitement. But getting a single was where we needed to be, and um, you know, all, our, all our contemporaries had singles, you know, the Moody Blues and the Animals, and they'd all had big hits and things. So uh, we started to... We'd already built up quite a following around London and around the south of England and uh, we just needed a hit record so we, we heard this For Your Love which was a, a demo disc that um, Giorgio, our manager, Giorgio Gamelski, he'd been sent from um, Graham Goldman's management and we just thought well this is a very unusual sort of song sort of way we wanted to go so had all that sort of mood about it so we decided to uh, go for it and of course Eric didn't, didn't approve he wanted to do something more bluesy and also he, he didn't quite gel with the rest of the band he was he was obviously destined to to be a solo player Eric Clapton departs to join John Mayall's Blues Breakers and eventually form Cream but before he left Clapton suggested that session guitarist Jimmy Page would be a good replacement Page, however, uh, didn't want the gig at the time. He was making a lot of money as a session player. He played on songs like uh, Goldfinger by Shirley Bassey, The Rolling Stones, Heart of Stone, Records with Them, uh, Van Morrison's first band, Petula Clark's Downtown, With the Who on I Can't Explain, Donovan's Sunshine Superman, Joe Cocker with a little help from my friends, and hundreds of others. But he recommended his childhood friend, Jeff Beck. We asked Jimmy originally to take the place of Eric Clapton and, uh, you know, Jimmy was very happy doing studio stuff at that time. And he recommended Jeff, who, who none of us had ever heard of at all, but he turned out good. Beck was happy to join the Yardbirds as he was able to experiment. Yardbirds, well, it was a perfect excuse for me to experiment on everything that I'd, uh, you know, all the influence that I'd picked up. Um, luckily, they... The, the group policy was to experiment and not stay with the traditional verse, chorus, verse, pop songs. We had to do that in order to get a single played. But within that single, I used to bend all the rules and I used to suggest stopping and changing the rhythms and uh, just changing the entire style for a few minutes or a few seconds of the song just to make it that different. So we used to blend in some of my, my sort of wild style with, with a fairly bland pop song. And there's this sort of like young kid waiting to break everything up, you know, inside. You can hear that in those early records. I, re I just loved playing live with him because there was no, there were no holds bar. It was like free, you know, free form wrestling. <laughs> More changes came for the Yardbirds. Things were getting out of hand, actually. And next to leave was bass player Paul Samuel Smith, who went on to become a very successful record producer. You'll find his name on albums by Cat Stevens, including uh, the classic T for the Tiller Men. Carly Simon's Anticipation, Jethro Tull, Paul Simon, and others. Again, here's Chris Drea, and I loved when he told me this story. By that time, we'd been playing sort of, you know, so many nights a week, and everybody was getting a bit brain dead. Um, Keith was drinking too much, and everything was getting a little out of control. And uh, we went up to, uh, I can't remember, it was Cambridge or Oxford, one of the universities, to do a a show that employed us and uh, they had the poppers and the mummers and you know graham nash and all sorts of people there and they had great catering big mistake for musicians uh and it all got a bit out of hand 
And Jeff had brought up Jimmy on that day, you know, just sort of invited him as a guest. And uh, poor old Keith got a bit bit under the weather and um, started forgetting lyrics and doing raspberries down the microphone. And, you know, we had to tie him up, I think, at one point, actually, to keep him upright. Uh, Jimmy loved it. Paul Samuel Smith, who, uh, you know, was a bit of a square peg, Another genius. I mean, he was a brilliant producer, but um, he was a bit of a square peg in the rock and roll hole of things, you know. And he kind of quit at that point. He was a little bit uh, too too much rock and roll behaviour. Uh, and Jimmy jumped in. He said, "Oh, well, you know, can I join?" <laughs> and he joined on bass for for a while, actually. You know, not too long, but for a while. So Jimmy Page joins the Yardbirds on bass guitar. Well, they just started playing bass guitar, uh, more or less ready to help them out because Paul Samuel Smith had decided to split from the band one night after a gig uh, and just refused point blank to do any more shows. And I happened to be there just with Jeff Beck and uh, they were in a bit of a quandary what to do, you know. And I said, well, I'll play bass. I've never played bass before. It seemed a good idea that, you know, twin lead guitars would be something to work towards. And if Chris Treyer could take over on the bass, who's in rhythm guitar, it was worth just bridging the gap with me on bass. So that's exactly what we did. It wasn't long before Page would switch to lead guitar, giving the Yardbirds twin leads. A dream situation looked good on paper. I wouldn't say it was such a great idea, funnily enough. On paper, it was a sort of a, a, an absolute sort of wow. But in reality, um, it was more of a cacophony. Uh, it's true, G- uh, Jeff didn't really like his lead guitar space being taken over by another you know, very genius guitar player, although Jimmy obviously joined the band as a bass player. Uh, and no, not many things were worked out uh, on stage. Uh, the only uh, single we did, which was really a great single, with the two of them playing sort of parts, was Happenings 10 Years Time Ago. And uh, that worked really well. The dream lineup with twin leads from Page and Beck did not last long. While on a U.S. tour, Beck would leave, and all of a sudden the Yardbirds were a four-piece band. Jeff. I freaked out, went mad, uh, had a breakdown, and I think I walked out and left the band. The Yardbirds continued without me. I disappeared, and Jim carried on. Chris Strea told me he specifically recalls the show they played when Beck didn't show up, and now there are four Yardbirds. I remember, I think it was an Avalon Ballroom show, and... uh, uh, Jeff had quit. He'd kind of walked off with, you know, sort of a hole in his head at that point. And uh, uh, suddenly we were a four-piece and the uh, the promoter announced to the crowd, very big crowd, and he said, oh, he said that the bass player is going to play lead guitar. <laughs> of course, it was Jimmy Page, you know, and of course everybody said, what, the guy's going to play lead guitar? What is this? We paid our ticket, you know. But of course he was amazing and I went on to bass and I love playing bass uh, with Jimmy, and um, yeah, we'll carry it on from there, really. The Yardbirds soldiered on as a four-piece, and they also recorded a commercial for the instant milkshake mix, Great Shakes. Remember that? It's uh, based on their hit single, Over Under Sideways Down. Shake Mix comes in two new soda fountain flavors. Flippy new chocolate fudge flavored great shakes and wild new strawberry flavored great shakes. Both turn milk into a real thick shake, so thick it stands up to a straw. The Yardbird story doesn't end there. Jimmy Page wanted to continue on and originally was going to recruit new members for a new Yardbirds, as I mentioned. That would eventually become Led Zeppelin, as we all know. Basically, I would have carried on with Jimmy as the Yardbirds because, you know, I love that band. But um, Jim and Keith both pulled out of our last American tour saying they didn't want a tour anymore. And you can't really take, uh, you can't take a horse to water and make it drink. So I knew that was the last tour. And also, you know, we'd been traveling and, and maybe playing 500 shows a year 
because in those days that's kind of how you made your money. Uh, so we were a bit brain damaged. It was like five years that sound, seemed like 20 years, long time. And I couldn't wait really to get away and get out and not be so reliant on these crazy guys, you know, because they're all a bit wacky by then. And I wanted to wake up in the morning and do my own thing, and that own thing was my other passion, photography. As I said at the top of this episode, the Yardbirds were very important in the history of rock and would leave their mark on many young musicians that were just starting out. Alice Cooper was one of them. Well, but you know, the funny thing was, is we had played with the Yardbirds. We opened for the Yardbirds when we were like 17 years old and in Phoenix at the VIP club. Uh, it was Keith Ralph, Jeff Beck, Chris Draga. Um, and I think at that time, it was Chris Draga on bass and Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck on guitar. But I'm not quite sure of that. It might have been Jimmy Page on bass at the time. Um, but I mean, you know, we, we had learned all the Yardbird songs. That was our, that was our biggest influence. So to be opening for them and the fact that we did their entire set before them, uh, and they were standing there giving us the thumbs up, you know, and laughing. And, you know, I guess it, it was a big compliment to them that here was this little band doing all their songs. And then, of course, they get up on stage and blew us away because they were the Yardbirds. You know, how would you like to be Jimmy Page? getting into the Yardbirds and then handing him a bass saying, well, we have a lead guitar player, some guy named Jeff Beck, you know, and him going, oh, okay, well, I'll wait until <laughs> the other guitar player leaves so I can play guitar. But how about that for a tandem? Uh, Beck and Page in one band. And then before that, it was Clapton. The Yardbirds also played a key role in the musical development of a couple of friends who grew up in Canada this is Getty Lee of Rush. Well, I think the first band that really grabbed my attention as a youngster were the Yardbirds. I always loved their sound. There was something about their their combination of blues played with that English rock attitude that really caught my mind. And I know Alex felt the same way and a lot of our contemporaries in that period. And it really got us interested in playing this kind of rock, which eventually evolved into the same kind of sound that Led Zeppelin came up with. And Aerosmith was heavily influenced by the Yardbirds, and Joe Perry told me that many years later he got to play Yardbird songs with his idol, Jimmy Page. Yeah, we had a uh, quite a weekend. We wanted to play, we were going to play the Marquee Club because it was something we always wanted to, you know, play the Marquee Club because it was kind of like playing the Whiskey A Go Go for an English band. Well, we talked about it, and he said, "Yeah, I'll come. I'll do that, and we'll uh, and we'll jam, and we'll uh, we'll have some fun." And as it turned out, the sound check was really the the high point because we got to play about I don't know about eight uh, Yardbird songs with them. You know, we played some, we played some Yardbird songs during the show, but but uh, you know, working out the, the the songs and which ones we were going to do was really an amazing thing for us, you know, talk about a dream come true to play, you know, uh, shapes of things with, with, uh, Jimmy Page. It was, it was great. And then he, then he took the bus with us out to Donington and, um, the next day or, or the day after, whenever it was. And so we spent, a, we spent three or four days hanging out with them. The Yardbirds were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1993 by The Edge of U2. And since 2015, Jim McCarty has been touring with a new version of the band and their legacy continues. So that's the story of the Yardbirds as well as the beginning of Led Zeppelin. There are a number of great books about the Yardbirds and you can check them out. One of the recent was by Jim McCarty who put out his autobiography a couple of years back and has a recent book out, She Walks in Beauty my quest for the bigger picture. That's going to do it for this edition of The Rock Podcast. Remember, you are always going to hear the greatest stories from the history of rock as told by the artists themselves as I share my archives. Keep in touch by going to our website at therockpodcast.com and you can see the video version on YouTube. And of course, we have a Facebook page. You can also contact me through the site or just drop a note to hello at therockpodcast.com. 
I read all the mail and appreciate your feedback. Until next time, I'm Denny Somak. Goodbye.